Hello guys and Merry Christmas. Uh, this will probably be one of my final videos of 2013. Uh, just got back from town, been absolutely manic. Not quite finished my Christmas shopping yet, but honestly, I'd had enough of it today. Uh, just got back and poured myself a little Christmas beer, uh, which I'm getting through rather quickly actually. Uh, but there's a video I wanted to do actually now that we're kind of wrapping up the, uh, the console generation that's been out over the last seven or eight years or so. Um, and I'm going to be ordering myself a PlayStation 4 when they're a little bit more readily available in the new year. So I thought we'd kind of take this opportunity to do a few memories and um, some of my favourite and worst moments of the last console generation that we've just had from about 2005 to 2013, which I think was the, was that the seventh console generation, I think. I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but yeah, so I mean, in this generation, I picked up an Xbox 360 originally, which you can see behind me, the white one there. Um, I've since bought a couple of PlayStation 3s as well. However, for this video, it's going to be a memories video about the Xbox 360, as this really was the preferred gaming console of this generation for me. Now, there are lots of reasons that I've got a lot of affection for the Xbox 360, um, because really, I mean, it was a system that got me back into gaming in a big way. Now, if you kind of trace my history back, I grew up in the, you know, the 16-bit era was really my main gaming era. And then by the time the turn of the millennium around 2000, when the PS2 came out and it was, you know, the Dreamcast and the N64, I was kind of going away to university at that point and I was really into like DJing and music and obviously, you know, started going out, ladies and all that kind of thing. Um, so really my interest in computers and video games kind of waned for a bit. Now, at the time, my brother did have a PlayStation 2, which I did play on when I went back home, and uh, my housemate had an original Xbox when we were at university. So um, I kind of experienced the early Xbox Live, and we used to play FIFA and stuff like that occasionally in our uh, university halls. Um, but really, I mean, for me, this was probably the first video game console that I paid for with my own money. Uh, since the, I think I was like, you know, when I was a kid, like the Amiga CD32 was probably the last console that I paid for myself. So uh, this was really a big change for me. I mean, I didn't intend on really getting back into gaming. However, I moved to a new city, didn't really have many friends actually. I'd just moved to Bristol around this time. Uh, got a job there, it was a new town, didn't really know anyone, just moved in. And uh, I bought myself my first HDTV. Now we're going back to, I think 2007 we're talking here. And this was really the first TV that I bought on my own. Before that, I had like, you know, shared one with housemates. So I got this HD TV. It was a 32 inch Samsung TV that cost me 699 pounds, um, an LCD TV. So not only my first TV, my first flat screen and my first um, HD TV as well. And then I was in town doing a bit of shopping one day and I walked into, I think it was Game Station I walked into, and they had the Xbox 360 that hadn't been out all that long here in the UK, I think only a year or so. And for some reason I was watching some of the um, the demos that were playing in the you know the cabinet they had in in Game Station, and I thought actually that game looks pretty cool. Now I can't remember which game was actually demoed on the screen, but I remember at the time thinking yeah maybe an Xbox would be quite a good way to you know pass the time. I'm new in town, not really going out much at the moment, a bit skint because we've just got a new place to live. So uh, I picked up this bad boy. Now um, <laughs> the pack that I got, as you can see there, that's the original. Xbox 360, um, the very first one actually, if you look there, it hasn't got the silver DVD drive on it. And if I'm to spin it around here, you can see it's the one without HDMI on it, which is how they originally came. Um, the launch models back in 2007, put that back down. Now I got the core pack, wanted to be, you know, I was a bit tight and I thought maybe I don't need a hard disk for it. So uh, if you remember the core pack, that was kind of the low end one. You had the core, then you had the arcade, I think it was called. They came with like a 20 gigabyte hard disk. So I bought the core, um, came with a couple of games, got home, quickly realized after about an hour that this system was gonna be completely useless without a hard disk. <laughs> Ended up going back into town and actually paying out for a hard disk separately. So uh, yeah, I mean, I don't even know why they sold that configuration of it, the core pack, that was a complete waste of time. When I got the hard disk though, you know, I was pretty impressed with it by then. Um, and to me, this was, it was a big change from what I had before. You know, I'd experienced the original Xbox and the PlayStation 2, um, and I had this HDTV. Now at the time, all I had hooked up to it was my Skybox. It wasn't a Sky HD box, uh, my satellite for those not in the UK. So I hadn't really experienced high definition content on my TV. So having the Xbox 360, even though it's kind of not true HD, you could say, because it wasn't HDMI, it actually used uh, component cables into the back of my TV. Um, even though, you know, I ran it in like, I think it was like 1080i upscaled. 
it actually looked so crisp though, and that was kind of my first introduction to, you know, pseudo high definition gaming. Now, when I first got my Xbox 360, uh, it didn't come with uh, a load of games. I can show you the ones I got at launch. Now, I think this was a game that was commonly given away to early 360 owners. Cameo, I think I pronounce it, uh, which I played a lot actually. I think it was probably the first game I tried out on the system. Uh, yeah, from 2006. Uh, yeah, it's not bad actually. It's a bit of a you know kind of fantasy game. Not really the kind of thing I'm usually into. Um, I also got Ridge Racer 6, which I think is amazing. You know, I was a big Ridge Racer fan, uh, even in the arcades and that when it used to be in like a full car cabinet back in the mid 90s. I used to love playing that in my local bowling alley actually. Still a big fan of this game now. It's still one of my favourite titles on the Xbox 360. I also got Dead or Alive 4 as well, which was great fun with another player. Uh, when I had, you know, to get eventually get some mates in the new city I'd moved into. We'd often stay up having, you know, drinking sessions and playing on uh, Dead or Alive 4. And then the game that really, the first game that really got me hooked on the Xbox 360 would be the legendary Halo 3, which I got not long after I got the system, actually, and uh, pretty much played through it in about a month, actually. Then, obviously, the online was pretty addictive, too. So, uh, the Xbox 360 was a bit of a game changer for me. Now, the, the first game that really got me hooked, though, and the game that really got me into online gaming in a big way would be Call of Duty for Modern Warfare. Now, I got this for my birthday. It was my birthday in December um, of 2007, and I think this came out around November. So I had my Xbox about you know, maybe six months at that point, and I remember seeing uh, a little bit of hype for this online, and my mum was like, you know, what do you want for your birthday? So I was like, oh, you know, that Call of Duty game looks pretty good. Got this, and then uh, my brother got an Xbox 360 shortly after, and a friend of mine as well. Now, as I mentioned before, I'd done a bit of online gaming um, back at university, uh, you know, with the original Xbox on a friend system. Well, this was really the first time I'd experienced proper online gaming, high definition, sitting in my own room, having the uh, Xbox 360 headset on, chatting away to my friends, and playing a game online. And we got really addicted to it, you know. I, I think today this is still my favourite Call of Duty title. And it's the one that we, you know, probably go back to the most still. This and Modern Warfare 2. I have got the later games, you know, pretty much. I'm a bit of a collector, so, uh, you know, if I buy one, I want to get the whole series. Even though I've probably played, like, Black Ops 2 and Call of Duty Ghost maybe ten times each. You know, not a huge fan of the series anymore. It's kind of peaked for me. However, this was a pinnacle of first-person shooters on the Xbox 360 for me. And we, you know, wasted so many afternoons. And because I moved to a new city, I mean, you know, I'd moved somewhere else, my family and friends were scattered all around the country, and it really brought us together. I mean, the only other way you could do it would be like a Skype conversation or phone calls, but for us it was a way to kind of chat with each other, have a, you know, a catch-up a couple of times a week, have a virtual beer together, and uh, shoot shit out of each other playing uh, Call of Duty 4. So I very quickly replaced the original wired headset with uh, one of these little wireless ones as well, which, um, I don't use all that much anymore as uh, we tend to use, you know, FaceTime and that one we're gaming these days, but yeah, having this on my ear here, you know, it felt really futuristic at the time. We're going back, um, what, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, nearly seven years we're going back here. So it's, uh, this console generation was around for a long time. Now, because it was my first HD system, I really kind of took advantage of the multimedia features and the video playback features of the Xbox 360 as well. Um, I remember I was really into, um, I got into podcasts like Dignation that were quite big and, uh, you know, Revision 3's kind of early content. And I downloaded those on my PC, put them on a memory card and uh, popped them in here. And do you remember there was a uh, kind of optional media update that you'd download that would let the Xbox 360 play back certain media formats? Uh, and I also started downloading a few films as well in like DivX format. Um, and really, you know, it was kind of my first way of kind of streaming um, video really it's you know the first time you know talking 2007 youtube hadn't been around very long um i'd certainly never downloaded movies and all that before i got the xbox 360 so it was a big change for me now the first interface on the xbox 360 had kind of those blades that were around for a couple of years then i remember i think it must have been about a year after i got this system the nxe came out in i think it was about november 2008 and that really did kind of feel like a new console when you downloaded that. That was a massive change for the system. Now, of course, these early systems were kind of dogged by reliability issues, and this is not actually the original Xbox 360 that I had. This is a fourth one. Now, the first machine that I got, I think, lasted me about seven months, um, and then I got the Red Ring of Death. Randomly turned it on one day, it came up. So I took it back to Game Station. They uh, told me to send it back to Microsoft. Did that, waited for about a week, um, got sent another one. Uh, I had to ship it back to Germany. 
Uh, they sent me another Xbox 360 out, then after that, uh, the one that I plugged in, it lasted me, I think, about another three months or so. Then one day I was cleaning and I moved it to another room, I think to watch some videos in my bedroom actually. I moved the Xbox from one room to another, plugged it in, and it red-ringed again on me again. Shipped it back to Germany, this was over Christmas time as well, so that really pissed me off. It took about three weeks to get it back. I got it back, plugged it in, it red-ringed within about an hour. So uh, this is my fourth one now, and luckily, it's been all right since about, you know, early 2009, so I've got quite lucky with this one. So I think what we'll do is we'll come in, have a quick inspection of the uh, original Xbox 360 model, you know, for old time's sake. So here it is, the original launch model Xbox 360. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with what this machine looks like, but I thought, you know, for historical purposes and documentation for the future, it'd be good to kind of do a quick overview of this like I do my uh, retro systems. So I've always done my Xbox 360s vertically. There are some people I've read online that swear they're not meant to be used this way and instead you should actually put them down horizontally and use them like this. Although, I'm pretty certain you can use it either way because if you look at the bottom there, Microsoft put feet on not only the, uh, the bottom of the system but also the side of it too. And the fact that if you look at the power logo here, it is orientated to point upwards which would suggest to me this is you know the kind of default orientation that you meant to use the system how they intended it so for all those people I keep reading online that say you should never stand them up vertically in your face right so um, let's have a quick look around the system so we've got the big power button here of course with the lights that um, correspond to the machine being on and also any attached devices that you've got um, above that we've got the uh, original machines had a white CD tray the later ones had like a, a silver one that was um, on the front here but they are detachable and you can change them. You can also change the uh, fascia on the front as well, so these could snap off, and you could put your own customized um, front of your case on, really. They sell those quite a lot in the early Xbox 360 days. Um, now we've got a sync button here that will sync the 360 to any wireless peripherals you may have, like the controller or the, uh, the headset that I showed you before. Something that was done away with in the later revisions, we've got memory card slots here as well. Now this is probably going to be the last system that will ever feature a memory card, as not only did the later 360s do away with them, when online took off in a big way there was really no need for those anymore. Um, we've also got an infrared sensor here as well for the optional media remote, and a couple of USB ports in the front there as well. Now if we turn it around to the side, you've got the Xbox 360 logo on there, and this machine's biggest fault, the original revision of the 360, had a couple of cooling vents here and a few at the bottom and that was literally pretty much all it had hence the uh, infamous red ring of death and I think on these early systems the failure rate I've read was anywhere from uh, about 31% to up to 50% so the ticking time bombs really uh, here we've got the power supply adapter a little bit more cooling on the back um, a proprietary AV adapter now these launch models didn't actually come with HDMI you needed a breakout connector to go there and I think to this day actually the 360 only comes with com uh, composite which is really shit um, you've got to go out and buy your own uh, cable to connect it to HDTV which is just really really tight in Microsoft um, we've got an Ethernet port there and there is one USB port on the back as well that I've got the optional Wi-Fi adapter connected to now these original 360s didn't actually ship with internal Wi-Fi so what you had to do is go and buy these external antennas which actually cost about 50 quid. It's cost me 50 pound for this Wi-Fi antenna. So as you can see they kind of built the system with these in mind. So this kind of clip on the back there. The later revisions had it built in. Now my original 360 only came with a wired controller which I've got here which is a USB controller exactly the same as the later Wi-Fi ones but it was actually pretty cool because I could use it with my PC as well for doing you know MAME and things like that so I keep the Wi-Fi one around uh, the wired one rather and then I went out and bought the uh, the Wi-Fi wireless controller not long after now I also, also got the play and charge kit on it too rather than keep buying AA batteries all the time and this is actually one of my favorite game controllers I much prefer this to the DualShock on the uh, on the PS2 and PS3 I just think this design's perfect. It kind of reminds me a little bit of the Dreamcast, but you know, a little bit more uh, compact. And everything just seems to be in the right place. And I find that I play games a lot better with this than I do with the uh, the DualShock 3. Now, later on in the console's life, they did obviously redesign it to uh, solve a few of the problems of the original Xbox 360. It kind of got the nickname the Xbox 360 Slim for some reason, although 
I think upon comparing the machines, if we've got the original and the uh, the slim, it's not really that much slimmer. In fact, I think they're probably about the same width. Slightly shorter, you know, maybe it should have been the Xbox short. Um, but there you go. Now, they did actually change a few things about this. Um, on the front of it here, this is actually a touch-sensitive um, capacitive button, so you literally put your finger on it rather than pressing it in like the older one. i uh, got the USB ports there as well. The sync button is still there. The tray. Now, if you notice, the memory card slots have gone on this one. On the side of it, the air vents are much bigger, so we've got a lot more cooling here as well. On the back, we've now got three USB ports as opposed to the one that you got on the original model. Um, we've also got a customized connector for the uh, the Connect that came out. We'll talk more about that in a bit. The AV breakout adapter there. HDMI is on here. Um, optical audio and the power supply adapter as well. Um, and hard disks on this model actually fitted internally. I think you get through them uh, the bottom of the system, although I've never actually changed it on this one. Not long after the start of this console generation, we did get a little bit of excitement when we had a holy format war. Do you remember it was red versus blue? HD DVD versus Blu-ray. In hindsight, I totally backed the wrong horse. I did actually go out and buy an external HD DVD drive, which you can see there. We'll have a bit of a closer look in a minute. For my Xbox 360. As I mentioned before, I'd gone out and bought myself an HD TV. I was really impressed by how the games looked on the 360 and uh, videos I downloaded off the internet. So I thought I wouldn't mind actual, uh, you know, physical format drive to buy movies on and watch them in HD. And obviously you were given the choice. Now, I already had an Xbox 360, so at the time I didn't own a PS3. And the PS3 was pretty expensive. I think it was like £600. So I think eventually by getting the 360 then later, the HD DVD drive, it still worked out a little bit cheaper than buying a PS3. And I was dead certain that HD DVD was going to win the format war. Uh, the reason really was not only the fact that you could probably get a setup slightly cheaper, but the name was the main thing and also the logo as well. I thought the name Blu-ray, it sounded a bit like um, a little bit too nerdy. You know, you think Blu-ray, you think like lasers and all that kind of thing. HD DVD to me, looking at the logo, it's basically the DVD logo with HD prefixed onto it. And it's high definition DVD. I thought consumers will understand that. This will be the format out of the two that will be the, the one that wins the war. Uh, obviously, you had Warner Brothers, who I think were really heavily behind HD DVD. Toshiba, I think, were the company that kind of, you know, were making a lot of the hardware. Sony were dead behind Blu-ray. Uh, and the war raged for, I think it was about 18 months, really. Um, and at the time, you could eventually buy drives that would play both formats. I didn't build up a massive HD DVD collection. I probably got about 20, 30 titles, all of which I've still got. And, you know, the drive gets occasional use if I want to watch, like, Training Day or King Kong every now and then. Um, as we know, the Blu-ray did kind of win the war. And a lot of people talk about the fact that the Red Ring of Death was probably Microsoft's biggest flop of the this generation of console. I don't think it was. I think it was the HD DVD drive because that thing was selling for like three or 400 quid originally. And you'd be hard pressed to find many people who even remember it now. So I think not being talked about is probably worse than the, uh, the Red Ring of Death fiasco. So I'll bring you in, we'll have a little look at the um, Xbox 360 HD DVD drive. Looking at it stylistically, it's not really much to write home about. I mean, you can tell by looking at it, it's kind of styled after the original Xbox 360 design. We kind of got this off-white casing with the, uh, the air vents kind of holes on the top of it here. And the Xbox Arcade model came with a brushed metal DVD tray, so they've kind of replicated that here with the Xbox 360 logo and an eject button that illuminates green when it's plugged in. There's also a uh, little pin eject button there in case it ever gets stuck, you can pop something in there. Now looking around the side of it, as you can see, you know, looking at it, it could almost be a mini Xbox 360 design. On the back, one thing this drive was actually good for, believe it or not, there was something, um, is that it actually gave you an extra USB port if you used it on the old school Xbox 360. You know, on the back of the Xbox, there was only one of them. Plugging this into one took it up and then you also get an extra one as well. So you can pop a USB stick or something or another device or a Kinect as I used it for on here. So it was quite useful in that respect. You know, it was kind of like having a little mini USB hub. Now, I have still got a few HD DVDs. I don't use this drive all that much. In fact, the main thing I tend to use it for now is if you look here, it's got a standard mini USB. Um, and this does actually work as a standard DVD drive. So. Using it on machines like, you know, netbooks or my Raspberry Pi that haven't actually got an inbuilt optical drive, you can just plug this in and it will basically be recognized as a standard DVD drive. So 
It's good for installing software and that on the odd occasion that you need an optical drive on systems without it. Uh, in case you don't remember what HD DVDs look like, um, this is how they looked. Very similar to Blu-ray. We get a Blu-ray case here. So stylistically, you know, they're both about the same size. Um, Blu-ray, obviously blue. These were red, so it was kind of the red versus the blue wars. Where you've got the Blu-ray logo there, you've got the HD DVD one there, which I thought, you know, it was a pretty cool logo. It was basically just the original DVD logo prefixed by the word HD, which to me probably <laughs> lent credence to the fact that this platform would be the one that would take off. How wrong I was. And, uh, and I ended up with this doorstop. Now, if we go forward a little bit after the Xbox 360 kind of been around a couple of years and became an established platform, it was really remarkable not only how long the platform lasted for. I mean, it came out originally in the US, I think, in 2005. Lasted till 2013, um, even though they are still being made now, it kind of dominated for nearly a decade, which is a hell of a long time for a console generation to be around. As I mentioned before, with stuff like NXC and the uh, new dashboards and uh, updates and everything, if you look at the original launch Xbox 360 to what it became at the end, um, it was a hell of a development and it really did feel like a different console. Now, one big step that Microsoft introduced on the back of the highly successful Nintendo Wii was this pile of shit the Xbox Connect. I remember the hype of this for a good year before it actually came out and I got my hands on one. I think it was called, was it Project Natal originally? Now if you remember watching E3 there was that demo, I think it was with a kid called Milo. Do you remember seeing that? There was a woman kind of, you know, standing in front of an HDTV. She had a face about this far from uh, the prototype Connect, and she's interacting with a virtual character on the screen that we never saw again after that demo. And it was obviously just some pre-rendered animation frames. Who on earth can get away with using a Kinect that close? When I got my Kinect, I literally had to clear my couch and coffee table out the living room to even get this damn thing to see me. Uh, now, it did promise some really big things when we saw the demo, and as anyone that bought a Kinect will know, it really felt to deliver on those, in my opinion. Stuff like voice recognition was absolutely dreadful. You'd end up shouting at the thing about three or four times before it'd even wake up and recognise you. It was so much quicker just to pick up your controller. And I think, <laughs> recently, the last time my Kinect was actually plugged in would be about June, July last year. I think I was watching the announcement of the Xbox One. For some reason, I'd had some friends around and we'd plugged the Kinect in and we played, you know, a couple of games of Kinect Bowling, which to be fair, I bought this thing on launch. I've probably used it about five times. Uh, really have no no ambition to kind of come home from work at the end of a long day, stand up waving my arms around the living room and, you know, leaping around the floor. When I play games, I want to sit back, chill with a beer, I want to get my controller. Motion games don't really interest me all that much. However, I did kind of buy into the hype originally and it was kind of cheap to buy. I think I got that for about 80, 90 quid. It wasn't a lot of money, so I went out and bought one. Now, if you remember watching the original demos, though, they promised it'd have things like object scanning, you'd be able to walk in the room, it'd recognise your face and log you in, and you could control your Xbox with voice, and, you know, you could slide all the panes around with your hands. All of this did kind of work, <coughs> but there were some big drawbacks to it as well. Now, as I mentioned, when I was using it back in July, the thing that made me really unplug this thing for a good long time, I was watching the Xbox, 3, uh, Xbox One launch, uh, and I remember the announcer on stage was talking through the demos of the system and he actually said the words Xbox Home. My Kinect heard it coming out of my speakers and took me back to the dashboard. I launched the demo back up again, he said it again, it took me back to the dashboard again. Now my girlfriend's into doing crafts, you know, knitting and sewing and all that kind of thing. We'll be sitting there watching TV and she'll be like knitting with her hands and then the, uh, the virtual hands on the screen will start going up and down the video would start rewinding and all sorts. It was such a hassle having this thing plugged in that now it sits on top of my TV, um, the power supply is not plugged in and it gathers dust for the most part. So uh, not to mention the fact that, you know, you can see the lighting in my apartment is not that great anyway. To use it in my living room, you've basically got to have like studio lighting to get the damn thing to even see you. If it's kind of nighttime, not in the middle of the day or you're wearing dark clothing, you've got next to no hope of this thing seeing you. So we'll have a little look at the hardware. I'll bring you in, let's have a little tour of the, uh, the Kinect. Now, looking at this thing, it always kind of reminded me a little bit of uh, either Wally -E or Johnny Five from Short Circuit. <laughs> Looks a bit like his head looking at you, doesn't it? Strange looking thing. Now, uh, funnily enough, the original Kinect is a lot smaller than the model that ships with the Xbox One. Um, and this is stylized in black, so uh, mine's a bit dusty. Doesn't get a lot of use. Uh, it's kind of stylized after the Xbox Slim, really, you know, to fit in with that. Obviously, the black look, it kind of didn't really fit in with my... Uh, original launch white Xbox 360. Now on the bottom, there's a little um, adapter here that you can kind of, a little mounting stand that you can hook that into a, uh, 
a stand for your TV to go on the back of it, as it does need to be as far back as possible for it to work. So I kind of got this um, an external stand that I think cost me about 30 quid to clip onto the back of my HD 50-inch um, HD TV that I've got these days. So uh, it kind of sits on top of my TV watching me. Um, generally unplugged, actually. It doesn't get a lot of use. So we've got the three cameras on the front of it, and there's an infrared sensor there as well. This one kind of glows red when it's in use. Uh, there is also a motorised head on it, so it will look up and down and kind of follow you around the room, which is a little bit creepy. On the back of it, not a lot. We've got this breakout kind of USB cable that comes off it um, with power included in that too. Now, on the Xbox Slim, there was actually a port for the Kinect that would power it. On the original models, you need to use an external power pack with it. So overall, it's been a bit of a mixed console generation. I mean, I'd probably say the positives outweigh the negatives. I've spent more time gaming with the Xbox 360 than I have any of the machines since the Amiga or the Sega Mega Drive, really. Uh, but there is one thing that leaves me a little bit sceptical, particularly coming from that perspective of uh, still enjoying kind of retro systems. I kind of think what will happen in, you know, not even the far future, in the near future. Say, for example, five years from now. Uh, I mentioned before that I enjoy playing Call of Duty 4 online, for example. Uh, what's going to happen in five years when those servers close down? Because it is going to happen, you know, they're not going to be on forever. And if you need any proof, you have a look at the uh, original Xbox. The Halo 2 servers, they were closed down in 2009. You might remember at the time there was kind of these uh, these guys that were playing online. It was kind of a competition to see who'd be the last man standing in Halo 2. And, you know, people left their consoles on for like two weeks. Um, but now, I mean, it's, you know, it's not possible to play it online through Xbox Live anymore because they turn the servers off, so that's a big portion of the original Xbox that you can't access anymore. And even more so with the current gen and, you know, this generation as well, DLC became something that was a lot more popular than it was with the PS2 and the Xbox original. And if you actually join me on Facebook, we've got a Facebook group, facebook.com slash cookietech. I'll put a link in the video description below. We're actually talking last week about a story that appeared on Reddit um, about a user who'd got a Wii U and he'd spent a fair bit of money, you know, it was up in the several hundreds of pounds on games from the Nintendo store. Now obviously I'm aware that Microsoft, Sony and Nintendo have kind of different online policies. However, what happened is this guy had bought all this DLC, they all lived on his, um, on his Wii U itself, didn't have a copy on physical media, and then his console broke. So he returned it to the store where he bought it from, they gave him a replacement model, then he went home, um, plugged it back in, hooked it up, signed into his Nintendo account, assumed that he could just re-download the games. He didn't get the option to do that, and he actually contacted Nintendo support who told him the only way you can transfer game licenses is by having the original console you want to transfer off onto the new machine. And this guy's like, you know, well, the first console broke, I haven't got it anymore. And they're like, well, you know, shrug the shoulders, you're out of luck then. Which is, you know, absolutely outrageous. This guy, you know, has lost several hundred pounds worth of games. And really that's a sign of things to come, I think, you know, if, uh, if you look at things that you get off Xbox Live, I mean, now you can actually get AAA titles off there. I looked, you know, you can buy Call of Duty Ghosts on there. And I think the price is pretty ridiculous. It's like 55 pounds or something. Um, but I can go to my local supermarket around the corner, get a copy on a DVD for like 30 quid. So that's one thing, you know, if it's DLC, they haven't got to pay for distribution. Um, there's no casing, no physical media costs, no artwork and all that. It should be cheaper, if anything, not like 15 pounds more. The only things I've really bought from Xbox Live are the arcade games, you know, stuff like um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Simpsons Arcade, Golden Axe Double Dragon, a few indie games like Fez I've got on there as well. They're all stuff that only cost a few pounds because I have actually had a few games uh, lock me out that I can't play anymore. I think Double Dragon, Golden Axe and uh, Outrun 2006, all of which I bought on my original Xbox. I then changed the hard disk on it and I've obviously got this newer machine since. Now for, for some reason, even though I transferred the content over, it tells me I've only got the trial. Click here to purchase and unlock the game. You think, right, you click that. It will probably just re-download it. It doesn't, doesn't give me the option, just kind of loops and opens a trial over and over again. And my brother, who's got these same games, has had the same problem with it as well. So, I mean, I should probably contact Xbox support, but I haven't really been that bothered about it. But, you know, thinking about it, if it was a game like that I'd paid £50 for, and I'd basically thrown away my money. And what's going to happen, for example, with this Xbox, you know, it's got a hard disk in it. When that hard disk dies in, like, you know, four or five years, if Xbox Live's closed down then, what about games like, you know, Call of Duty, all the map packs that I've paid for, and Halo, all the DLC I've bought for that, and, you know, all these Xbox Live arcade games, and 
there'll be no way to re-download them, the servers will be offline. And also you'll lose a big part of the online experience as well when the servers go down, you know, you won't be able to play these games online anymore. Which is, uh, which is kind of sad, you know, it really is. It's, um, it's not future-proof in any way. I mean, I'm sure there'll be some people that will kind of hack the servers and give you workarounds, like they did with Halo 2 and that shut down in 2009. There is a way now to put your original Xbox into your PC and then kind of jack that into another network online and then kind of fool the system to think it's a local link, but it's that much asking about that you go on, there's like three people playing, you know, it really did kill it, so... It is a concern going forward as well, um, and you know, some people think that this console generation we've got now, the Xbox One and the uh, PS4 and the Wii U, will be the final devices that we get with physical drives in them. Now, personally, I'm not convinced that the internet backbone is quite ready for the entire world to download the next Call of Duty or FIFA or whatever game, you know, at midnight on the night it comes out. We're talking games, that, particularly in this generation, Blu-ray sized games. Some of them are up to like, you know, 15, 20 gigabytes. Um, on my connection here it'd take me like a week to download it so I do like to have a copy of the original game um, just because you know not only, only my collector but I think with games as well it's harder to back them up it's not like having an mp3 or a movie where you can you know I can copy it onto Google Music or an external hard disk and have it on every device in the house games with all of the kind of you know lockdown DRM and everything it's not really as simple as copying it wherever you want you've got to rely on those servers being up so going forward, I think, you know, as a retro console in like five, ten years, maybe the Xbox 360 won't have much value from a collector's perspective because all the games will be crippled, really. And one thing we did see in this generation is um, people releasing buggy games to meet deadlines. There was, you know, I, th I think a lot of developers were guilty of that. We'll push it out the door to meet the Christmas deadline, for example. If the game's got bugs in it, I'll sod it, we'll, we'll fix it later with a patch. All well and good, but then, you know, when that server goes down, if you haven't got the patches or your hard disk dies and you install a new one, you're back with what was originally on that DVD, the buggy original version of it. So it is going to be pretty sad going forward, but um, I mean, there we go. There's a little retrospective of the Xbox 360. Hope you enjoyed it as well. It's been, it has been a really enjoyable console generation. And for now, you know, I've, I've got no regrets about any of the systems I've bought in this gen. I'm looking forward to seeing what the PS4 will offer me when I pick one up probably in January, February time. And if you've got any memories you'd like to share, any thoughts as well, leave them below. There'll be links for the Facebook group, my blog, and my Twitter links, all of that as well. And if I don't see you before, have a Merry Christmas, and I'll see you in 2014.